Job chapter 11. Job chapter 11, we, we began the chapter last week and uh, we got down through, oh, verses 7, I believe it was. Uh, Zophar is speaking, Zophar has taken it upon himself now to, to answer Job in his, uh, in his opinions, give his thought on the, on the issues, and his is not much different than the other two, as we saw. And uh, Zophar makes accusations that uh, Job uh, is lying, and uh, by claiming that uh, you know that Job was, he made the statement that Job had said that he was clean in the, in in God's eyes, and his doctrine was pure. But while Job may think that, no doubt, uh, he had not said those things, but. Uh, Nonetheless, so far as just like the other two are is misrepresenting uh, Job. Um, I know we don't like to use this word too much because a lot of people use it uh, flippantly, and but uh, he, they are misjudging Job, really. Uh, <clears throat> verse five, he says, uh, so far says, but oh that God would speak and open His lips against thee. We saw, uh, we looked at uh, some other verses last week that uh, uh, talk about when God speaks, and later in the book of Job, to Zophar, or to Job and Zophar, uh, his, Zophar doesn't really understand. I mean, he's, uh, <laughs> I think Zophar has got, like, it, like all the others, good intentions, uh, but he's uh, he doesn't understand really who God is. Uh, Job more understands who God is, even though Job is going through what he's going through, even though Job is um, a little self-righteous, he does understand God more than these other three gentlemen do. And uh, so far, I'm not sure how old he is, uh, but he's probably younger than Job, no doubt. And uh, whenever... Uh, you know, a young person, you have to be very careful when you uh, approach somebody that's been through life a little longer than you. <laughs> and uh, you think, you know, you got some, some help for them. Uh, most likely that's not the case. Most likely they could probably teach you a few things. And uh, so, Zophar is in that, in that situation. He's uh, speaking out of turn. But nonetheless, he's speaking, and God recorded it, so we have what he says. And 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 just uh, just like the other two, a lot of most of the things he says is correct, um, but they're just not correct for Job. So as we go through these verses, we'll see some things. We'll point out things that uh, Zophar says that is absolutely right on the money, uh, while it's even while it's misplaced, um, he is correct, and God did speak. God, uh, he will speak. He did speak to Job. Obviously, we'll see that later. But God did speak, and He's spoken and uh, given us His word. So we have the spoken uh, anything that God spoke to man that He wanted penned down. We have it in in front of us right now. I mean, that's a that's a pretty awesome uh, statement that we have everything that God spoke to man right here, if you want it. And uh, so God did speak and. Uh, it says in verse 6, and that he would show thee the secrets of wisdom, that they are double to that which is. Know therefore that God exacteth of thee less than thine iniquity deserveth. We we looked last week at this statement by Zophar and kind of uh, paralleled him to a hyper-dispensationist thinking that he knows some things and secrets of, of God that Job wouldn't know. And there's some folks out there, and, and there are a lot of people out there that don't know the Bible and they, when they should. They're, they're born again. Uh, they don't read it. They don't uh, meditate on it. And there's some people, there's some Christians that are just ignorant when it comes to the things of God, uh, and they're willingly ignorant. The Bible says, uh, but uh, 
but when it comes to somebody that believes this book and 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 and, and takes it upon themselves and obeys God and, and studies it and reads it, uh, you're gonna you're gonna know what God wants you to know if you come to it with the right attitude, as we said last week, and uh, with a believing heart and faith. God will reveal to you what it is that you need to know, and He'll show you the mysteries that are in this book. Uh, and there's not a group out there that because they um, they think that they have uh, you know a step up on r- the rest of the Bible believing crowd uh, be- by claiming to you know know some new doctrines that you know weren't revealed before. That's hogwash. Everything that's been that's been revealed has been is revealed uh, through the Scriptures. Uh, God brings to light some things uh, through different uh, through different means, but nonetheless, it's all in here. Anybody that wants it can come to this book and get it. If you want truth, it's here. If you don't want truth, he'll 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 send you a lie. <laughs> he'll he'll oblige you. He's not just going to leave you alone if you don't want truth. He'll he'll go so far as to send you a lie so you believe a lie. You say God would do that? <laughs> yeah, He did. He did in the Old Testament. He's going to do it again in the tribulation period. And I guarantee he's doing it now. All these new translations, you don't think God is up, you think God's up there going, oh my goodness, what am I going to do now? All these different versions. No. He, he's letting people, he's letting, letting people have enough rope to hang themselves is what he's doing. Uh, he's God. He's, he's God Almighty. If he wanted to put a stop to it, he could have done some miraculous thing and, you know, every time they tried to print a new version, destroyed the printing press. I don't know. He's God. He can do whatever he wants. But he allowed it to happen. Why? Because man wants to believe a lie. You want to believe a lie? He'll let you. And he'll, he'll even... Uh, there was a... If you're familiar with the story in the Old Testament, there was a, a king, a certain king, that wanted to go out to battle. And he said, okay, I want to know what God has to say about it. But he really didn't. He said it with his mouth, but in his heart he didn't want to hear the truth. So... God said, okay, we'll send him down a lie. He, and, he, and there was a lying spirit in God's presence. Not, he, didn't send, he didn't pull somebody up from hell and say, okay, you evil person. go." No, he sent somebody from, from the throne. Say, go, go tell that guy what he wants to hear, and then I'm going to destroy him. That's the way God is. Just the way he is. Can't mess with him. And then he makes the claim that uh, God is, is getting out of Job less... And, and putting on Job less than what Job deserves. <laughs> and we can all say amen to that. We all get less than we deserve. I mean, that's kind of a, a you know, there's a famous radio guy that uh, makes that a, his, one of his, you know, sayings, you know, financial guru. And, uh, and I'm sure he's sincere about that. But it's more than just a saying. It's more than just a cliche. We all get less than we deserve. Ezra 9.13 says, And after that, all that is come upon us for our evil deeds and for our great trespass, seeing that thou, our God, hast punished us less than our iniquities deserve and hast given us such deliverance as this. Now, he's given us salvation when we deserve hell. He's given us eternal life when we deserve eternal damnation. He's given to us eternal peace when we deserve uh, eternal torment. Uh, that's what we have in place of our iniquities. We have His righteousness in place of our sin. That's what He's given to you and I in the, in the person of Jesus Christ. Psalms 103 verse 10 says, He hath not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. <laughs> Amen to that. Uh, we, the, 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 the truth still is that you will reap what you sow in the flesh. Uh, just because we are, ha, have grace, that's a, that is a, uh, a truth that uh, is, has to do with your spiritual condition and your eternal state. And uh, at times has to do with this flesh down here. Listen, we don't reap everything in this flesh that we deserve. But you will reap what you sow, even as a Christian. Uh, you sow, Paul told us, he said, if you sow to the flesh... You will of the flesh reap what? Corruption. Now, we know there's no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus, but he followed that up with said, who walked not after the flesh. Now, that, that scripture, you have to rightly divide and understand that, yes, there's no condemnation. You are, you are uh, perfect in the sight of God in the sense of your standing. 
and you are 100% uh, on your way to heaven. There's nothing can change that. You're good, you're signed, sealed, and delivered. But uh, when it comes to your state down here, walking in the flesh, there is condemnation if we walk after the flesh. And so, be careful. You will reap what you sow. If you sow to the flesh, you will of the flesh reap corruption. Uh, just because you're saved, if you go out and get drunk, you're going to reap that uh, whatever happens to you after you get drunk. That's the bottom line. You're not just because you're saved. He doesn't absolve us from, <laughs> you know, the chemical uh, things that happen in our body when we put things into it that we shouldn't. He says in verse seven, "Canst thou by this is Zophar speaking? Remember, canst thou by searching find out God? Canst thou fi- fi- find out the Almighty under perfection?" And that's where we left off last week. And uh, God has worked it out so that if Man doesn't have faith, he cannot know God. And we looked at some verses. We're not going to look at all of them again this, this morning. But look at, uh, let's turn over to um, 2 Corinthians chapter 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Just to get us back in a mindset where we were last week. 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 12. Canst thou by searching find out God? Second Corinthians chapter 3, look at verse 12. He says, Seeing then that we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech. Paul says, uh, you know, if I got something that I want everybody to have, <laughs> I want to make sure everybody can understand it. You know, he's, uh, he was very, Paul was a, was a learned man. He could speak, he could orate uh, the, you know, the ears off a hog, I guess you could say. But uh, but he didn't. He used great plainness of speech. And uh, tell you what, if you're going to get up in, in, in front of somebody and talk, make sure you, you don't have to be, you know, you don't have to be like vulgar, but you can be plain. Plain preaching is what gets the job done. He says, we use great plainness of speech and not as Moses, which put a veil over his face that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished. But their minds were blinded for until this day remain at the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament. All right. So in the Old Testament and the nation of Israel, the Jews, even today have a veil over them. They're blinded. When they read, when they read their scriptures, when they read their Torah, the Bible says they're blinded if they don't believe in Christ. Because the rest of that verse says, which veil is done away in Christ. Which veil is done away in Christ. And he goes on to say, but even unto this day when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. All right, And so God has made it such that the, the nation of Israel, and in the, in the sense it's the same with the, with the Gentiles, We have to come to this book and, and come, approach God with faith. God is not going to accept uh, somebody coming to him with doubts, saying, okay, God, prove me. Prove to me that you're God. You know, this business about, uh, you know, just just ask God to, you know, prove himself to you. <laughs> oh, listen, he already did. <laughs> this, is what he, this is what he gave us. You're not going to go to God and say, okay, God, uh, you know, prove yourself. That, prove to me that you're God. Show me a sign. What are you, a Jew? No. He says the, the, the Jews require a sign, the Greeks seek after wisdom. He's given us this book. That's how he revealed himself to us. And you have to believe this book in order to get anything from God. And that veil can be done away with when, a, when the nation of Israel, they're blinded because they've rejected their Messiah. But look how it says how it's done away. Verse 16. Nevertheless, when it, talk about their heart, shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. God will reveal Himself to anyone who repents. And repentance is not a physical act of you cleaning yourself up. Repent, that's not repentance. You know, there are people, there are people that think that, you know, repentance is, you know, how much you cry and, and uh, how, uh, you know, how much you 
you know, hurt yourself in order to make, make sure you're sorry. That's not what repentance is. This, is. this is one of the best definitions of repentance I've ever read in the Bible. Uh, this helped me with a lot of doubts. When, when, I, when there's times when, you know, you hear some preaching and, you know, boy, if you weren't, uh, you know, crying a bucket of tears when you got saved, then you must not have got it. Well, different people have different emotions. And uh, when the Bible talks about here in this verse, uh, verse 16, when it shall turn to the Lord, that's talking about the heart of the nation of a person of a, uh, in the nation of Israel, specifically in this passage, but it goes for everyone. When you're presented with the gospel, that's the, the, the way God uses this thing is uh, by the preaching of the gospel, men are saved. And when people are presented with the gospel, whether it's through a gospel track, whether it's through something they hear on the radio, whether it's through you know sitting in a church, whatever the however that message is presented, that person has to do something with it in their heart. All right, whatever they do with it in their heart is going to depend on what they do with it in their head. So when their heart turns to God and says, well, boy, whatever I've been believing, whatever, whatever I've been doing up until now has, has not worked, uh, I think I'm going to go his way. As soon as that heart turns to God, then he takes that veil away and you can believe the gospel. It's not a uh, Calvinistic teaching where you, know, you can't believe until he, just, until he gives you light. It requires repentance on, on, on our part. Calvin had it wrong. God didn't just pick somebody and say, okay, I'm going to let him repent. No. When the heart turns to God, then God takes the veil away and man can believe the gospel. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6 says, But without faith it is impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. You're in 2 Corinthians. Turn over to chapter 4. Oh, the next chapter. Verse 4, look at verse 4. Or look back up to verse 3. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which, which what? Not which he's chosen to blind, but because they don't believe, he's allowed Satan to blind them. And as we said, and when we started out, if you don't want to want the truth, he'll send you a lie. He'll, 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 either, he'll either send you somebody from the throne or he'll allow Satan to blind you. The mind, he's blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. And so, uh, jo- Zophar asked Joe, can thou by searching find out God? Well, in the general sense, you know, the, the, the Bible says, you know, that uh, no man seeketh after God. Uh, that's speaking in generalities that, you know, the majority of mankind is, is the opposite. They're going away from God. They're, they're, they're seeking other gods. But when a man, when God, when His Holy Spirit is drawing, and His Holy Spirit has been drawing ever since Christ was lifted up, He said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. All right, it's not a it's not a pick and choose type thing. He's drawing all men to him. Uh, all men won't be saved though, and so when the Holy Spirit start, begins drawing on a person, begins trying to uh, show them the gospel and get them to a place of sal- uh, of repentance where they can be saved, man can find out God. He's made it easy to find out about God. So far. In this statement, he, and he follows it up with another with another question: Can thou find out the Almighty under perfection? And we read this last week, but I want to read it again uh, by this uh, John Gill, an old commentator. He says, "Quote: God is not to be found out by human search. In other words, you're not man just isn't going to set out to find God and, and, and find Him. Uh, that there is a God may be found out by." Uh, that there is a God may be found out by inquiring into the book of nature, by considering the creatures that are made. The, the heavens declare the glory of God, the firmament showeth his handiwork. God's creation, we, we learn in, Rome, in the book of Romans, early on in the book of Romans, that the, the, the whole creation tells us about God. 
by considering the creatures that are made who all proclaim some first cause or maker of them, who is God. But then it cannot be found out what God is, His nature being in perfections. And he, the philosopher, being asked by a certain king what God was, required a day to give his answer. And when that was up, he desired a second, and still went on asking more. And being demanded the reason of his... De- uh, di- I don't know, this is an old word. <laughs> Dilatorian... Dil- dilatoriness. Look it up. Replied, the more he had considered the question the more obscure it was to him. The world by wisdom, or the wiser part of the heathen world, knew not God. Though they knew there was one, they knew not who and what he was. And therefore, in some places, altars were erected to the unknown God, as we see in Acts 17.23. And though some of the perfections of God may be investigated from the works of nature, such as the power, wisdom, and goodness of God, according to Romans 1.19, Yet not all his perfections, such as his grace, mercy, etc., proclaimed and displayed in Christ, nor indeed his counsels, purposes, and decrees which lie in his eternal mind are uh, are the thoughts of his heart, the deep things of God, which none but the Spirit of God searches, knows, and reveals. In other words... You can find God. He's allowed you if you if you have a, a, a believing heart and, and come to Him in faith. He'll let you He'll let you find Him. But you're not going to know Him until you get saved and you allow Him to speak to you through this book. You're not going to you can't you can't uh, uh, have a relationship with God without being saved. That's the bottom line. <laughs> like Brother Mark said, it's easier to be a Christian once you are one. Look at verse eight of Job chapter eleven. Now, now Zophar, as, as the kids say, he be truthing <laughs> here in verse 8. Speaking of God's perfection, it is as high as heaven, what canst thou do? Deeper than hell, what canst thou know? The measure thereof is longer than the earth and broader than the sea. Again, the it here is most likely a reference to the perfection of God from verse 7. However, it could also be simply a reference to God Himself, the Almighty, from verse 7. God the Son, you say, but that sounds pretty irreverent, (laughs) saying, calling God an it. It sounds like it, but uh, listen, God the Son was referred to in the neuter sense in Genesis Genesis 3.15. All right, look back at Genesis chapter 3. Bear with me. Don't faint. I'm not saying God is neuter. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. Here's the great prophecy of uh, the virgin birth. Let's start with verse 14. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, above every beast of the field, and upon thy belly shalt thou go, and the dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. We know what the, the her seed is referring to, right? It's called talking about the, the Messiah, Jesus Christ, the son of David. He, it says, It shall bruise thy head. It didn't say he, but it says it shall bruise thy head. It shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise, then it says his, heel. So we know he, it's, the Bible's referring to a person, a, the, 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 the person of Christ here in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. It shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. All right, look at um, also in Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1, look at verse, uh, come down to verse 35. And the angel, excuse me, and the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy, what? The holy thing, which shall be born of thee, shall be called the Son of God. So here we see in these two verses that 
the God the Son is, re- is referred to in the neuter sense. Uh, and God the Holy Spirit is in Romans chapter 8. Look at Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, come down to verse 26. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now, these new translations, listen, you can spot a crook by his inconsistencies. Eventually, you know, he's going to contradict himself. A liar is eventually going to, you know, you can only tell so many lies before you're, you know. And these, these false translations, they, what do they claim? They claim that, uh, you know, we ought, the King James isn't as accurate when it translates, you know, in, in its translation uh, from Greek to English or from Hebrew to English. And therefore, you know, they've got the, the more accurate translations, and uh, But when it comes to stuff like this, they'll take these words and they'll translate them and they'll, and they'll change your Bible and not follow their own rules. And that's what they do in this case. They, they you know, with maybe some good intentions, they feel it's irreverent to call the Holy Spirit it or Jesus Christ it or God a thing and, you know, but but don't mess with my Bible. If God said it that way, let it be. Now, again, I'm not saying God's neuter. Now, you're going to have people that, that they're, they, they, try, they even make Bibles that, that take out the, 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 the gender references to God. But listen, this is fine. When God does it, it's fine. He's the author of the book. He can do whatever he wants. If he wants to write something originally and then change it in the New Testament... That's, he does it all the time. He does it all the time. That's, that's the privilege of the author. When, when you write a book, you can do that. Until you write a book that's perfect and holy, don't change it. When God wants to do that, when God wants to refer to himself as it or Jesus Christ as it or a thing or the Holy Spirit as it, he can do that. But uh, when a liberal scholar insinuates that the creator of the universe is uh, not a man, is, is a neuter, is, you know, we shouldn't refer to God as a he or him, or, 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 or they go as so far as to say that God's a woman. I'll leave that alone. There are plenty of scriptures to prove otherwise. Listen, these are three, ver- three or four verses that we've looked at that show that it's okay that Zophar... Called, he's either calling God it or uh, talking about his perfection. If it's reference to the Almighty from verse 7, then it's fine. But there are plenty of other verses in the Scriptures that tell us that God is a him. <laughs> the, best, the best one. Now, we'll just go to one, just because I like this one. Exodus chapter 15. Exodus chapter 15. And this one, this one burns them in so many ways, it's pathetic. Next time, you know, one of your, well, let's just read the verse. Exodus chapter 15. Look at verse 3. It's such a short verse. The Lord is a man... He is a man. That's what the Bible says he's a man. If you have any doubts, if God's a man, here you go. The Lord is a man. Not only is he a man, but he's a man of war. Oh, boy. The women would not get his vote. Some of them. Some of them would. Uh, You know, that's the whole thing about, uh, you know, this, this last debate, you know, Romney was being kind of nice because he didn't want to seem like a warmonger and didn't, he wanted to get all the, the, the middle of the road people's vote and all the people that are, you know, a little stringy spined and, you know, and the women. 
So he didn't use, you know, didn't want to talk about war too much. Well, listen, if that's the problem, then then God's got a, you know, he's got a problem. He's not going to win the election. God is a man of war. I don't think he's going to worry about the election, though. I think he, you know, whatever way it goes, <laughs> I think he's going to, he's going to be okay. He's not going to, he's not going to fret. Uh, there's no, there's no met, uh, shaking God up. So God's a man of war. He's not afraid to tell you. He is a man. Uh, just because Zophar uses the phrase it here doesn't mean that God is not a man. In the, in the, in the sense, if, he's, if the it here is as high as heaven, is his perfection, everything about God is perfect. Everything. There's not one thing that he falls short in, that he needs some help from you know, Dr. Phil or somebody else to, to bring him up to our level. God is perfect in every way. No one can reach him. He says here, it is as high as heaven. Whether it's talking about God himself or his perfection, nonetheless, nobody can reach God. Solomon understood that he couldn't contain God. Look at 2 Chronicles chapter 6. 2 Chronicles chapter 6. If you remember, David wanted to build God a tabernacle, wanted to build God a temple, not a tabernacle. They had the tabernacle. But David wanted to build God a tabernacle, and because... Because David was a man after God's own heart, you know, David was a what? A man of war. Um, God said, nah, you're, you got some blood on your hands. I, you know, while I, while I like that about you, David, you know, my temple's got to be kind of, you know, pure. And I'm just going to save that for somebody else. Um, Solomon, when Solomon came on the scene, Solomon remembered what David, and David probably told him, you know, what he had desired to do and uh, the plans that he had for God, making God a temple and, and Solomon took it upon himself. He said, okay, you know, God has given me the peace. You know, my, my reign has been full of peace. I haven't had to fight because my dad took care of business. Second um, Chronicles chapter 6, Solomon is praying to God. And he says, look at verse... Um, Look at verse 17. Now then, O Lord God of Israel, let thy word be verified, which thou hast spoken unto thy servant David. And, but, but again, Solomon, even though he's wanting to fulfill the, the desires of his dad's heart, and he's got the same heart for God, he still don't understand why David wanted to do this. He don't understand the concept. Look what he says. But will God in very deed dwell with men on the earth? Behold, heaven and the heaven of heavens cannot contain me. How much less this house which I have built. So he got the thing built and he's standing there and he's looking and he's going, this, <laughs> something just doesn't make sense. Here, we built this house for God. And the heavens can't even contain him. What are we thinking? It's a, it was a, God allowed it. I mean, you know. You know how you're a parent and you allow your kids to do things for you and they really don't, you know, don't reach that. And you just, you, you, but you let them do it. Why? Because you know they love you. You know you're, you're wanting to encourage them. That's what God did. He didn't, he didn't say build me this house so I can have a nice place to stay. Solomon understood this. The psalmist couldn't comprehend God's glory. Look at Psalms uh, 148. Psalm 148. Remember, Zophar says, His perfection is as high as heaven. What canst thou do? Psalm 148 says, in verse 13, Let them praise the name of the Lord, for His name alone is excellent. He's not going to share it with Allah. He's not going to share it with Buddha. He's not going to share it with anybody. His name alone is excellent. His glory is above the earth and the heaven. God Himself let mankind know that He shouldn't try to conceive him in Isaiah chapter 55, over there in uh, Isaiah chapter 55, the famous verses, and we all know them, and we, we probably quote them more than a lot of verses, but just to get us to where we, you know, man understands that you're not gonna, you're not gonna figure God out. Isaiah chapter 55, verse 6 Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. 
Call ye upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. All right, so, so get all the preconceived ideas of God out of your mind is what he's saying when you come to God. You know, just forget what you think about God, what, what you think you know. Forsake your thoughts and let him return unto the Lord and he will have mercy upon him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. God says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. God himself let us know that we shouldn't try to conceive God in our mind. You can believe him. That's what he expects us to do, just believe him. But try to conceive him? Try to, you know, say you've got a handle on who God is and you're gonna, you just know all about him? Unlikely. And even his mercy is higher than you can imagine. Psalms 103. Psalms 103. And, you know, we're just hitting a few attributes of God. Everything about God is perfect and higher than we can even imagine. Psalms 103, verse 11. For as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is His mercy toward them that fear Him. His mercy is higher than we can imagine. Zophar says, his, It is as high as heaven, what canst thou do? Deeper than hell, what canst thou know? The measure thereof is longer than the earth and broader than the sea. Deeper than hell. He says, Deeper than hell. The Bible indicates that there are multiple depths to hell. Turn to Deuteronomy chapter 32. Deuteronomy chapter 32. <clears throat> if on your own time, Deuteronomy 32 is is one of those chapters. I mean, the whole Bible is is, is awesome, but there's a certain chapters that you go when you go through, like First Corinthians chapter 15. That's a that's a heavy one. Deuteronomy chapter 32 is chock full of stuff. I mean, the law first mentioned. There's some things in here that just well, anyway, just to tweak your curiosity, you might want to go home and read Deuteronomy chapter 32 as a whole. He says in verse uh, 22, For a fire is kindled in mine anger, and shall burn unto the lowest hell, and shall consume the earth with her increases, and set the, on fire the foundations of the mountains. All right, so I, it's elementary. <laughs> when I was a kid, going in, through school, they taught us. You know, you have you know, low, lower, and lowest. That means you have one, Two, and at least three. <laughs> All right? There's at least three levels to hell, at the very least, according to your Bible. Hell is, well, look also at Psalm chapter 86. Psalm chapter 86. Now, the, the, the Isaiah, Brother Isaiah and the teens had this uh, hell night on Friday, uh, Friday night and uh, pretty good turnout, I think. I think it was a success. And uh, maybe next year, if they do the same thing, we'll get you know some more kids. And and what the idea was wasn't to you know give them an alternative to Halloween. When we do these things with the kids, you know, with the harvest party, it's it's in a in a way that's what it is. It's an alternative. Right, because we don't want them celebrating Halloween. Halloween is, you know, as my daughter calls it, Halloween. She doesn't even realize it, but she just that's what she calls it, Emily. Halloween. Um, it's it's of the devil. <laughs> you know, it's wicked. Um, what we do is not an alternative. We're not just trying to say, okay, well, you don't get to have fun, so here's this. No, what the idea behind Friday night was, and I believe Brother Isaiah will attest to this, is to 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 try to show people that you know all the the fake stuff that people do and. And, and dress up as the devils and, and, and just death and, and wickedness, it, there's a real hell. 
and they're really going to go there. It's not a game. It's not a. It's not a. It's not going to be a. You know, a, a dress up thing. It, no, that's, they're really going to spend eternity there. And uh, anything we can do to to show them that, take advantage of this time of year. I'm all for it. Uh, look at Psalms chapter 86. He says, For great is thy mercy toward me, and thou hast delivered my soul from the lowest hell. Again, the psalmist <coughs> indicates that there's more than one level to hell. Look at Proverbs chapter 9. One more place, Proverbs chapter 9. Look at verse 18. But he knoweth not that the dead are there, and that her guests are in the depths, plural, of hell. And so we're going to stop there. We're going to come back to uh, Job chapter 11, verse 9 next week and talk more about hell But because uh, there are people out there that believe hell is the grave. There are people out there that believe hell is just separation from God. There's different things about hell that people believe, but we're going to look at the Bible and see what the Bible says next week. All right, you're dismissed.